Hi everybody, it's your favorite boomer, Russ Barkley, back with another research update, this time for the week ending July 14th. Uh, and along with me today, making another cameo appearance, is the moose. Moose Barkley, say hi moose. There's my moosey. Okay, he just wanted some more air time because his contract is up for renewal. There you go, bud. Hop on down. We'll talk about your contract later. Don't forget what happened at ESPN a couple of weeks ago. Keep that in mind. So, all right, uh, we have a veritable dog's breakfast of research to talk about this week. Uh, you can find all of the research that was published in the thumbnail sketch that accompanies this video. Uh, I remind you again that I don't review uh, dissertations or master's theses that may have been put up on the internet, and I don't review animal research uh, either. So I try to stick with clinical research uh, involving people. Uh, so first up this week is a, a modestly interesting study of the prevalence of ADHD in people who presented to clinics with a gambling disorder. This study took place in Japan uh, and it was uh, published in the Journal of Gambling Studies uh, and it looked at, as you can see here, uh, a group of about 40 patients who qualified for a diagnosis of gambling disorder and then assess them for the extent to which they might have had ADHD. And you can see here that the prevalence of ADHD was about 27.5% had comorbid ADHD with their disorder. Uh, that's a pretty high rate, by the way. When we think about adult ADHD, it's about 3 to 5% of the population, it varies slightly across countries, but not by much. And so this suggests that the rate of ADHD among those with a gambling disorder is um, at least five times higher, if not more so, than in uh, we would see in the typical population. Now, interesting, this study found that compared to people with just a gambling disorder and didn't have ADHD, the ones with ADHD had higher rates of autism spectrum disorder, lower rates of marriage, slightly less years of education, and marginally lower employment rates. So that's the characteristics of the people who had both gambling disorder and ADHD. So uh, a little bit worse off in some of these comorbid characteristics than those who simply had a gambling disorder. On the other hand, the study did find that when they went on to introduce intervention for the gambling disorder, those with ADHD actually stayed in treatment longer uh, and had higher participation rates than the subjects who didn't have a ADHD with their gambling disorder. So uh, a rather interesting study. We know that ADHD predisposes people toward problems with not just internet addiction uh, and gaming disorder, but as you see here, also in the larger category of gambling disorders. Uh, this study reversed that and started with people with gambling disorders and finds a higher rate of people with ADHD with them as well. So it looks like the comorbidity goes both ways. ADHD predisposes to various forms of addictions, including in this case, gambling, and gambling disorder is certainly associated with higher rates of ADHD. So uh, have a look at that study if those sorts of topics interest you. Uh, next up uh, is uh, actually a rather poor study at that, but I'm gonna use it anyway because I wanna talk about digital therapeutics. This was a study on the potential effectiveness of one uh, game known as Neuro, uh, people call these digital therapeutics or digital medicine, probably simply to elevate the status of the treatment in the minds of people from that of simply playing a game. Uh, so now we're calling it digital medicine. But uh, in that case, this study looked at uh, a, an app that you can play uh, on a smart device uh, called Neuro, and it involves two games. Uh, one is to help you with impulse control. Uh, the other is to help with working memory. Uh, and then, of course, it adjusts the difficulty level of the game based upon the individual's performance of the game. A lot of other games do this as well. Uh, you can also go online to various websites that have cognitive rehabilitation games that you can play as well, such as Lumosity, for instance. But So what we want to know uh, here is what was this study about? This study compared 30 Korean children 
uh, before and after they practiced on the game for several weeks. And of course, the study reports that the kids were better after they had played the game than they were prior to playing the game. So, and there was improvement in various rating scales uh, as complete, completed by their parents. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about this study for a couple of reasons. One is that it's not a very good study. Uh, it's only what we call a pre to post comparison. And you always get effects when you do that. So when you take people before treatment and then you assess them after treatment, it always looks like the treatment did something or nearly always. Uh, and some of that is a practice effect on the measures, on the rating scales. Some of it simply has to do with exposure to uh, the attention of professionals uh, and getting the kind of services that you think you need. Some of it may have to do with a bias toward the particular treatment that you're getting. You think it's going to work, so it does, and you say that it does. So this is not really a controlled trial in which we are comparing this act of treatment against a placebo or against another act of treatment to really evaluate whether or not it's specific to the treatment that we are seeing these effects. So uh, again, not a very good study, but I did want to talk to you just briefly about these digital medicine or digital therapeutics. There are many of them on the market. One review suggested up to 300 different apps, games, and other uh, software that can be used to help people with ADHD. Very, very little research on them. What little research has been done, uh, for instance, was done on devices like CogMed, uh, in which the individual practices working memory and other games to see if it improves ADHD. And what we find is that people get better at playing the game. They also get better on tests that we use to evaluate them that are very, very similar to the game. We call that near transfer. But when we look at how these people are doing in the natural environment, home, school, work, social functioning, we don't see far transfer. We don't see improvements in their behavior in those environments as a result of participating or, or playing these digital therapeutic games or, or other software apps. So at this point, uh, there's a lot of hope, a lot of hype, a lot of promise with digital therapeutics, but very little controlled research, quality research that demonstrates anything more than simply you get better at the game and you get better at tests that are similar to the game and that's about it. So a lot more research needs to be done on these apps and devices before we can recommend them for clinical practice. So um, that's one study on digital therapeutics. And again, as I said, not a very good one. Uh, in the next article that I want to talk about, this article was published in the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Journal, and it's a comparison of children who underwent an elimination diet compared to children with ADHD who had a healthy diet compared to treatment as usual, clinical care as usual. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting study done over in Holland, uh, and it involved a relatively large sample of children with ADHD who were randomly assigned either to get the elimination diet or to simply get advice about healthy nutrition or were simply cared for as usual following the guidelines in the Netherlands for the treatment of ADHD, which usually involves things like medication management for many, also recommending behavioral parent training, consultation to schools, uh, and uh, education about ADHD to the family, counseling about ADHD. So that's care as usual. So what did this study find? Well, in comparing the elimination diet, which removed a variety of substances from the children's diet, thought to produce allergies or sensitivities in those children, such as colorings, flavorings of preservatives, sugar, gluten, dairy, uh, and so on. It's been proposed that these things lead to ADHD symptoms or worsen ADHD symptoms in kids who already have it, and therefore removing these offending substances from the diet was supposed to be beneficial to the children. And there have been a few studies uh, that have suggested that that was the case. Uh, not very good studies in my opinion, but that's beside the point here. The 
Alternative was to be assigned to a healthy diet, which was simply recommending uh, a good nutrition program for families for their children. So uh, more vegetables, less sugar, less soft drinks, less white bread, more whole grains, the kinds of things that you might think are sensible in advising people on a healthy diet. And then finally, there were their children who had the clinical care as usual. So what did the study find? As you can see here, fewer children in the elimination diet did well compared to those who had the healthy diet. So about 35% of the kids in the elimination diet were found to um, respond to the diet compared to 51% who had the healthy diet also showing a partial or full response uh, in improving their symptoms of ADHD. Uh, despite the fact that there was good adherence in both diets to adhering to the diet as judged by the clinicians in the study, uh, the elimination diet was not as effective as just a healthy diet. And then when you compare both of these diets to the clinical care as usual groups called CAU here, we find that the CAU group did just as well as the healthy diet group. Uh, and that is that children who got care as usual, in some cases medication, about 74% of them received medication, uh, along with recommendations for parent training, school management, uh, counseling about the disorder and so on. Those kids did just as well as the kids in the diet. There were no differences and they did better than the kids in the elimination diet. So uh, this is a, a study that shows that these elimination diets were not effective in this particular instance. Uh, therefore, these offending substances believed to lead to allergic reactions and sensitivities to uh, things in the diet of the individual are not particularly effective at helping children uh, and probably are not contributing to their ADHD symptoms. So a, a pretty good study here done by a large research team over in the Netherlands. Uh, the last article I want to talk about is a analysis of research studies on the value of physical activity in improving attention in school-aged children with ADHD. It's a meta-analysis. It summarizes a, a review and analysis of 10 studies that met the criteria to undergo the meta-analysis. And of course, as we already know from these individual studies, the meta-analysis found that uh, in increasing physical activity for children with ADHD does help to improve their attention problems. Not surprising, I only mention it here because it is a review of all of the research, not just individual research studies. Uh, this is why we are now recommending for children with ADHD and adults with ADHD that they increase their rates of physical activity in order to help them cope better and improve their symptoms. Now, this is not a permanent cure. Uh, it is simply a way of, on a day-to-day -day basis, helping to manage and control your symptoms a little better. Uh, there's no permanency in improving these symptoms. So in other words, if you stop exercising, what's probably going to happen is your symptoms are going to go back to what they were before you were uh, you underwent the increase in exercise. So, but, but again, just one more review showing that physical activity may be good for helping people with ADHD in improving their attention. Uh, one last note I want to make, it wasn't a research study, it was actually uh, a book that is about to come out. Uh, and it is by uh, Will Kanu, Laura Naus, Kate Flory, and Cynthia Hardung. And uh, these are colleagues of mine. Laura Naus is also my daughter-in-law, I should point that out to you. Uh, but the book uh, is on thriving in college with ADHD. It's a cognitive behavioral therapy skills manual that therapists can use for helping college students. Uh, there are two books here. One is for the therapist. The other is for the students to employ themselves. Uh, it's available, as you can see here, through the Taylor and Francis uh, Publishing Company. Uh, and I only mention it because there's so little out there in clinical practice in terms of these kinds of very well organized, very specific manuals for helping college students with ADHD, uh, that the fact that it's finally coming out now, I think 
uh, needs to be recognized. So these are all four experts on doing CBT with adult ADHD, particularly uh, in the case of several of them with college students, and they've organized their treatment approach into, I think, a very good uh, manual, easy to follow. And as it says here, there are sections that deal with organization, with time management, with planning, with academic skills, also healthy lifestyles, adaptive thinking, uh, improving your relationships, and other things. So you, you might want to have a look at this. The book will be out shortly, and they're taking advance orders for it. So uh, congratulations to the authors for putting out a very useful clinical tool. So, uh, so again, uh, thank you for joining me for this weekly update on research. I uh, hope you found it informative. If you did, please subscribe to the channel and recommend us to others. Uh, and we hope to see you again on this channel uh, in the future for other research updates. Thanks everybody for joining me and be well.